Okay, folks, let's um, get going, I think. Andre Stefan, <laughs> sit down. <laughs> um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'm just finding out how long we're actually running till because we're starting 15 minutes late. So if we can go 15 minutes longer, that would be great. But Rosanna, who's the logistics person, will tell me exactly what to do, as usual. So bear with us. Um, well, my name's Dan Hill, and this is James Halal. Uh, we're from the faculty here. And we're going to do a kind of an interesting session, or I hope an interesting session for you today, which is about a new initiative, which is um, somewhere between Australia and Denmark, put it that way. So it's about a Danish initiative called the Reduction Roadmap, and we're working with some partners in Denmark on this. And we have a video message from them, so I'll shut up in a minute and we can listen to a Danish person speak, uh, which is always entertaining. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, James and I will talk about the Australian end of stuff. And then we're going to try and do, we're just going to try and split you into a few different groups. So bear with us if there's a little bit of shuffling around, but we'll do it very loosely. Um, but that'll give you a chance to discuss something and then feed back to us at the end of the session. So, um, all of these big words just say we're in a real mess when it comes to the built environment sector, but I guess you all know that, otherwise you wouldn't be here today. So I'm not going to dwell on any of them in particular, but um, I don't quite share some of the slightly rosier opinions of some of the panels we heard earlier, particularly around embodied carbon. So that's the thing we're going to talk about here, not the operational stuff like the easy things like LED lights and to some extent heating, ventilation, air conditioning and solar panels, they're the sort of low-hanging fruit, and we've eaten a lot of those low-hanging fruits and we're on the way to doing so. This is the much tougher stuff, which is the carbon em embodied in the supply chain around buildings itself. Um, and it's, let's just make, be clear as well, it's kind of political, as you can see in the top right-hand corner, there's a handful of countries in the world that have really contributed a huge amount to the climate breakdown, of which Australia is one of those. Um, 92% can be more or less attributed to the global north. And you see, you know, lots of the rest of the world, the so-called global south, has not contributed much. So some countries have to try harder than others. And those countries in this case, for this session, are Denmark and Australia. So we're going to talk about those specifically. And then in the bottom right, just to put that on the table as well, uh, we have a very supply side approach to housing, the so-called housing crisis, which is not really a housing crisis in a sense. It's a misallocation of housing and um, gearing housing purely around uh, a financialized market. But there's lots of empty homes in Australia. There's at least 1.5 million with three or more spare bedrooms completely empty. So it's more or less like a misallocation of space. Nonetheless, we, the way we tend to fix that is just by building, 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 building. And you see that's the same in Germany, 400,000 homes a year, but there's at least 1.8 million empty homes in Germany and so on and so on. So we want to be really clear that these kinds of housing strategies, and just talking about housing here, of course, we could talk about also commercial and industrial buildings, but just housing alone carries a huge carbon cost. And we're not really talking about that. As you'll see in the news, I guess, uh, we'll have a conversation about the housing crisis kind of over here. And then there might be some kind of conversation about the carbon or climate crisis over here, but they're not really seen as the same thing. But of course, they are the same thing from a materials point of view. We're using the same materials in either way. And some colleagues of mine at UCL and many other universities have done calculation on, for instance, the UK housing policy, which is supply side again, saying if we built all of those homes, that's the whole carbon budget gone for the UK for everything. So no carbon left for football or pubs or <laughs> clothes or whatever else British people like to do. I should know. I'm one of those people. Um, so we need to sort of stop seeing these two things as separate, housing policy over here, climate policy over here, and pretending there's some minor overlap around things like LED lights or heat pumps, but actually see that it's the same thing. And we need, or however you want to describe this, a common good or an ecological approach, just say it's the same thing. And yet, as you probably know, we don't tend to do that. This is Victorian recent housing. Uh, I won't say where it is. Um, it doesn't really matter in a sense, but there's lots of Victorian housing that looks like this. And this is being built right now. Um, and you see the numbers down the bottom there about, you know, the number of people per household has gone down since 1969. But the average size of the new house has gone twice as much since in that time. So 
again, we're not really building homes for people to live in. We're building homes for um, a resale market, and that has a huge carbon cost. So, in the context of this, we want to talk about a thing called the reduction roadmap. And reduction is a very complex word. Roadmap is also a complex word, <laughs> actually, it turns out. And it's very hard to make roadmaps these days. But we want to talk about a thing um, that, uh, that Denmark has started discussing and say, what would we do here in Australia? It doesn't have to be the same thing. We're a different place. But we might want to think about the same sort of strategies or questions, at least. And to frame that a little bit, um, we've asked our colleagues in Denmark who we're working with here to give us a little introduction to that. So primarily there are effect architects, E-F-F-E-K-T, effect, um, who are a Danish architecture firm who started this initiative. And then uh, Tewa, who are an Australian Danish firm based in Sydney and Copenhagen. We're working with specifically through colleagues here like Andre Stefan and James Halal and Rob Crawford and increasingly many others. And in the framing of that, just to be really clear again, you know, this, the, the, the question is, we only have, as Deb put it this morning, a certain amount of materials on this very finite thing that we live on. Um, and that isn't something we can just magic into a different condition. And so as Johan Rockström, who's one of the, as you probably know, leading climate scientists, 1.5 degrees is really should be seen as a physical limit, not a kind of a target we might choose to hit. It's like that is absolutely it. And now, as they say, a message from Denmark. <laughs> so um, we'll try and get this to play for you properly because we're having problems with the audio a minute ago. This takes about seven minutes or so, so settle in. Pretend you're watching a Nordic noir on SBS just to get into the accent. And my colleague Mikkel uh, will talk to you. My name is Mikkel Aarhusdal. I'm a principal at Tawar Architects and Head of Innovation. Uh, pleased to be able to address you today on the matter of reduction roadmap Australia. Uh, I'm situated in Copenhagen, Denmark, which is probably also why I was invited to talk today uh, in order to give maybe a small context for, for the evolution of the reduction roadmap here. Uh, and, uh, and and where the discourse is now. Uh, I would like to say also that I might be able to draw a little uh, so some parallels to, to um, uh, the Australian Danish context, which are obviously not the same. So what I will do is to I will present the why the reduction roadmap uh, happened, uh, uh, shortly how, how it's structured, uh, and then uh, talk a little about the, the current state of it and, uh, and where the discourse in the industry is now. I'm going to share with you a screen. So basically, uh, the reduction roadmap was initiated in 2022 by a private public uh, collaboration uh, by architects, companies, engineers, uh, universities, uh, foundations, and uh, so on. The overarching frame uh, of reason uh, for, uh, for starting the reduction roadmap, of course, is uh, the planetary boundaries. The fact that six out of nine planetary boundaries are now exceeded and that if we continue the, the same path, uh, we will have an uninhabitable Earth. The question, of course, is to, uh, to what extent it's relevant for the building industry. Most of you would probably know that uh, 37 to 40 percent of uh, all uh, carbon emissions are caused by, by the building industry. But that obviously also means that we have uh, 37 to 40 percent of uh, the potential solutions ahead of us. So the question, of course, is how can we build within the planetary boundaries? Uh, what is the goal um, and how do we get there? So that was the main target uh, for, for reduction roadmap to begin with, to figure out. The way they uh, approached it was to say, well, we have, a, we have the planetary boundaries, there is an, an emission budget. Uh, if we look at the budget uh, from 2020, uh, that meant uh, three to 500 uh, gigaton CO2 uh, at our uh, disposal. Uh, if we continue the same path as uh, the current state of emissions, that meant that we would run out of our budgets in 25. That's next year. So uh, what the... Um, what the people behind the reduction roadmap did was to say, well, we need more time. Uh, and we might do that by having a gradual uh, decrease in emissions uh, per year. But that, so that gives us where we need to be by 2031. Um, of course, this was all on a global level uh, scale, but we need to also uh, translate that into an, uh, an industry scale. Um, so what they did basically was a top-down uh, approach where we looked at the global emissions, then looked at the national emissions, then looked at the industry, 
the housing and the emissions per square meter per year. In this way, we got numbers uh, on the current state uh, that we know. And this is uh, just to contextualize with life cycle assessments. Um, LCA uh, is calculated uh, with a 50 year lifespan here, expectancy lifespan here in per square meter here in, uh, in, in Denmark. Uh, I think it's different than Australia, right? Um, but that means that we need to go from high emissions to lower emissions. And uh, but how long do we have to get there? Well, I'm skipping some equations, but basically, when when the reduction mobile was developed in 22, that meant that we had uh, between uh, three and seven years to reach uh, our goal. Of course, that's changed. It's less now, uh, uh, and it will also be less in Australia for sure. Uh, what I probably didn't say was that the overarching sort of goal was to keep within the 1.5 uh, Celsius um, increase uh, from industrial levels, uh, which probably most of you know we've already exceeded. But nonetheless, uh, we need to keep the emissions down. So uh, when do we do it? Of course, we do it now. Uh, Denmark was the first. Uh, country to introduce uh, requirements on CO2 uh, for construction. This is neg negotiated every second year, uh, which is also another uh, context for why the reduction roadmap uh, got the momentum that it got here in Denmark. Because basically, uh, half a year ago, it was a time for the second review or negotiations for the 2025 limits. And uh, what happened here was that a uh, reduction roadmap uh, made a huge uh, media campaign to involve uh, the entire bu uh, building industry uh, and also to contextualize it in a European uh, uh, context because we are looking into a new taxonomy here uh, that will be implemented. Um, and what happened was that more than uh, 630 uh, organizations within the build environment, we are talking architect studios, con contractors, um, uh, developers, uh, municipalities, uh, universities, everyone you could uh, uh, imagine uh, in the who's affiliated to the building and developers and so on, producers, uh, co-signed a letter for for uh, for the building regulation to keep within the Paris Agreement, basically. So this was a huge pressure put on the politicians uh, in order to regulate our own business, basically. Um, and this is where we are now, in a way, uh, it, the, the negotiations has, or the regulations have just been uh, made, not as ambitious as the industry, but still better than before. Reduction roadmap now also is in its uh, third iteration, uh, which means that uh, there's just been released a new um, report called Beyond Reduction Roadmap. I urge you to see it because it also comes with uh, solutions on how to do it, and it brings also biodiversity into the equation in terms of uh, the role biodiversity has on, uh, on, on reducing emissions. Uh, the other thing I would say here, which is uh, very important to understand uh, in, a, in a sort of national co uh, and industry context, um, is that in Denmark today, uh, you, you basically cannot uh, talk about the built environment, talk about architecture uh, without talking about uh, climate change. So uh, as, uh, as recently as last week, I went to a huge conference, a uh, building fair basically, um, and uh, there was not one single uh, conversation or lecture or um, presentation that didn't include the planetary boundaries. It's simply not uh, <laughs> it's simply not debatable anymore in Denmark, uh, at least not on, on, on a professional level. Uh, that doesn't mean that we are as good in practice as we are or action as we are in discourse, but I think it's 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 paramount to understand that there's a huge uh, discourse change happening here. We also see it on the universities where the student starts that uh, you, you cannot talk about architecture without talking about planetary boundaries, without talking about uh, the protection of, of, uh, of uh, the planet Earth.
So, so that's uh, that's my short introduction to uh, to the Danish context and the context of production roadmap. I hope you will have a, a, a pleasant uh, conversation today. I hope uh, this little short pitch is of inspiration. If there's any questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to either me or Gerard uh, from Chawa or Dan Hill, of course. Thanks, Dan, for inviting me. Uh, and on that regard, uh, have a nice uh, day. Bye bye. <laughs> tak for that, Michael. Hey, dog. Um, so that was the Danish story, which I think is kind of a super interesting story. He's, as he said at the end there, in practice, they're not quite where the discourse is, as is usually the case, but the discourse has moved a long way. And you, again, uh, Gerard Reinworth, who's at Tewar and therefore in Copenhagen and Australia, he's Australian, um, he said, you know, how we acknowledge the country at the start of the day today. It's almost like in Denmark now, there's an acknowledgement of carbon at the start of every single meeting, at least in a built environment context, which is something for us to think about, I think. In a, it's a complex thought, but it's an interesting one. Um, and beyond the roadmap, just to flag this, you can download it from there. Um, as you saw these kind of drops, the red stuff there, which is what Mikhail was showing in green, this is them extending it now to building in biodiversity regeneration and pulling carbon out of the atmosphere as well. So it's got a much more holistic model now, not just dropping carbon in buildings, but also looking at um, materiality as part of that. So I might just hand over to James now to talk through um, what we're doing in response, because we've, we've had multiple conversations over the last year or so. I wrote a chapter for the Beyond the Roadmap report, which has just been released, and I'm very keen that we as a school and with you here, I'm sounding more Danish the more I speak, oh my God, um, with that we have a conversation and uh, this is kind of a movement. As you saw in Denmark, it was very much led as a movement from the industry towards regulation. So it's an open invitation to come and talk to us afterwards, the days after, whenever you like about this. But in preparation for that, we started looking at, well, what if we did the same in Australia? And so these are our early cut of numbers um, with very smart people like James and Andre and Rob Croft and others who know these numbers inside out. So this is a bit like the shampoo advert where I say, here's the science bit, and I hand over to my colleague. I feel like I'm here as the scientific human shield. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but the start point of the Australian reduction roadmap is the same as the starting point of the Danish reduction roadmap, which is the planetary boundaries. Uh, that states that in order for us to operate within the planetary boundaries, uh, we need to be operating within this global carbon budget of 2.51 billion tonnes of CO2 equivalent emissions per year. And if we were to distribute that budget equally across um, all the different countries in the world taking into account the population of those countries, then Australia would be responsible for 8.23 million tons of CO2 equivalent emissions, which in a way goes against what Dan said earlier at the start of this uh, presentation by talking about how countries like Australia have a greater responsibility in addressing this issue. The Danish reduction roadmap, as well as the Australian one, uh, actually does not adopt that position. It's one in which all people in the world, all countries have an equal responsibility uh, based on their population. So that's an interesting point of debate that perhaps we can unpack in the, uh, the interactive activities afterwards. Mm -hmm. But this is where Australia is in terms of our current carbon emissions. So this is where we should be at 8.23 million tons of CO2 equivalent emissions. Um, we are 69 times greater than that today, which means that we require a 98.57% reduction in our national uh, greenhouse gas emissions in order to operate within the planetary boundaries of, of Earth. Now, looking at the uh, built environment and specifically at housing, <clears throat> we know that in Australia, on average, we construct about 200,000 homes per year and that Australia has actually one of the largest average size homes in the world. Uh, and that video that Dan showed uh, sort of demonstrates that. Um, our average home size is 186.3 square meters, which means that on average every year we construct about 37 million uh, 
uh, square meters of uh, new built floor area. Now that means that we require around 17.21 million tons of CO2 equivalent emissions per year to construct our housing demand. So where did that number come from? Over the past couple of weeks, uh, together with colleagues, including Andre Stefan, who's here, and Professor Robert Crawford, uh, we've estimated the um, life cycle greenhouse gas emissions intensity of Australia's um, housing demand to be 461.8 kilograms of CO2 equivalent emissions uh, per square meter per annum. So we did the calculations using the EPIC database, which some of you here might be familiar with, a hybrid life cycle inventory analysis, uh, well, a database, is, database that uses a hybrid life cycle inventory analysis approach. We did uh, quite a lot of modeling, taking into account technological advancements over time when it comes to the decarbonization of the grid, as well as to improvements to the technology and building systems. And it's important to note that this number is averaged over a 50-year period. So if we were to construct Australia's housing demand today, it would be around the 650 kilograms of CO2 equivalent emissions, uh, um, CO2 equivalent emissions per square meter. But because of those technological advancements over time, that number drops, but there's an inertia uh, in this approach. So that's why uh, it's at 461.8. Just a reminder, at the first slide I presented, I mentioned that Australia's carbon budget to operate within planetary boundaries was 8.23 million. That's for everything, including the football and the pubs and everything that Dan mentioned, which, me which means that uh, our housing-related carbon emissions alone is 2.09 times greater than our national budget for carbon to operate within planetary boundaries. So significant changes are required today. And if we assume that all sectors are equally responsible in the reduction efforts, that means that we also in the housing sector need to achieve a 98.57% reduction in life cycle greenhouse gas emissions intensity, which means that that 461 number needs to drop down to 6.63. Now, the, the Danish reduction roadmap uses slightly different metrics in which these numbers are annualized over the entire life cycle of the building. We don't think that's the right approach because it's scientifically incorrect. It discounts the temporal nature of these greenhouse gas emissions. If we were to build houses today, we release greenhouse gas emissions today. It's not annualized over the next 50 years. But so we, that's why we are releasing the, these numbers as well as the annualized numbers in order to achieve some consistency with the Danish reduction roadmap um, for various reasons, strategic, also related to communication and, and uptake, which means that we need to go from 14.2 to 0 0.2 kilograms of CO2 equivalent emissions per square meter per annum, again, a 98.57% reduction in the um, life cycle greenhouse gas emissions intensity of our house. And on that uh, bright note, I'll uh, <laughs> pass it over. Is that operational then and the other one can work? Good question. So, no, we've accounted this, this number, accounts for both embodied and operational, but um, can anyone guess how much operational um, is included in that number? 50? Anyone else? 75. 75%? Okay. 2.4 kilograms of that is operational. The rest is entirely embodied. And the reason for that is the technological advancements I talked about and the decarbonization of the grid. And even without that, uh, operational tends to account for the minority of emissions. Anything, Andre, you'd like to add? Yeah, maybe just to add that this is new bin. So all these houses are seven stars, at least going forward in the stars ratings. And this includes heating and cooling on, as per the Danish roadmap. So in the Danish roadmap, they did not account for non-thermal requirements. So this is thermal requirements only. It does not account for laboratory or TV or coffee machine. Now, 
In the release of the Australian roadmap, we will be very transparent with the adopted method. We could have spent the 45 minutes today talking about the underlying assumptions and the sensitivity analysis behind these, but we, we thought we'd leave it there in order to have an interactive session uh, afterwards. Um, yeah, thank, thank you, James. My job as a director is always to give, get somebody else to give the bad news and then I'll come and tell some jokes again. But so that was, no, thank you for that question because this is why I was said earlier, I'm not so rosy on some of the panels we heard earlier on saying that we can get to decarbonized built environments like in Australia anytime soon. You know, it seems to us at least like we're so far away in terms of the supply chain and the embodied carbon in particular. And so that very, very small number that James said of kilograms is, is again, the low hanging fruit of the thermal stuff, some of the energy in the building, um, electricity in the building and so on. So um, what I wanted to take away from that anyway, from Mikkel's talk as well, was this, this point here, that it's not possible to have a conversation about built environment without planetary boundaries coming up right at the start. So I said something nasty about energy. Um, and so what, just we'll get to the, now to, to a group discussion in a second. But one thing I wanted to just, just talk about then is uh, some of the beginnings of some approaches that we're thinking about at least. So along with all this op op analytical work that we're doing, and again, the EPIC database is an amazing database of materials and their carbon qualities. Andre here has built a... Um, a digital spatial twin essentially to enable us to then take those materials and build them into typologies so you can start speculating how much would a town be or a village or a whole city from the door handle up to the city which is extraordinary james there's a ton of work on software to reduce carbon in the engineering and architecture stage directly we're also beginning to swing some of our architecture studios around the question of the materials so this is work that andre bernice has been doing with students up at Dukey, which is our agricultural campus, about two hours north of Melbourne, towards Shepparton, um, which is just used by the Faculty of Science for making agriculture. <laughs> and we, of course, are trying to understand, well, agriculture and architecture, in this sense, at least, and materials could be very, very closely integrated, as in we could grow material for buildings, straw, hempcrete, all kinds of things here. So these are shots from the students. There's a huge algae pond there. You'll see that at MSDX next week. These are students kind of wandering around looking at this stuff. So we're beginning to do a lot of work around swinging our architecture studios around this question of materiality. There are options, just to be really clear, ahead of us as a sector. They are just massively towards retrofit and deep renovation in the first instance, followed by new build in the gaps, where we don't have enough already. And then when we're doing any of that stuff from largely biogenic materials, from regenerative sources with the carbon tract all the way through the supply chain and afterwards at end of life as well. So recognizing that they, in a building, the, the materials that make this building existed before this building and they will exist after this building, as you heard from Deb Chatra this morning, and they're just momentarily in this form as a building. And that's a huge swing towards the material flow as opposed to the building being the focus in the first instance. So, um, does anybody have just, let's just take a quick question while we've got um, a bit, little bit of time and then we'll have a very brief discussion in a group. I know we've just thrown a lot of numbers at you and some pretty scary numbers as well. So there'll be a lot of what the hell <laughs> going on in your heads. But just to give you a chance, does anybody want to ask a question or make a comment? Yeah, thanks. We started looking at, well, correct me if I'm wrong also here, but we started looking at the new build housing challenge because that's where the government's policies are largely, as you know, like it's 1.2 million homes a year in the next four years. It's therefore 300,000 homes. Um, so we wanted to make that connection very, very strongly and then, then use that as a lever to suggest that, okay, now we need to talk about deep renovation, retrofit, what housing stock do we already have that we could use? Just to be clear that when we're talking about retrofit, we also have to do that with something like biogenic materials and regenerative sources. So you still end up at the same point of having to rethink the sector. So is this, is so, yeah. this an opportunity to, are you trying to think about government policy so that we're not talking about actual new homes, but how do we 
So that's a question we'd love to have you as a, um, start discussing now, actually, because we I have an opinion, and I'm more interested in the opinion in the room here as well. Um, so that's that's a very good question for us to have a discussion about because it's fairly fundamental. Obviously, it's linked to the whole idea of home ownership and all of those challenges. It sounds like the focus is um, buildings or the application of buildings and cities by definition being yeah, um, yes, we started with buildings for sure. And Andre's model goes a bit wider than that. So we can start looking at transport emissions as well. I would love to do a reduction roadmap for SUVs, as you might guess, based on my opening comments this morning. I think the way we approach transport is exactly the same problem. So we might do that next. We could do it around lots of other things as well. But one of the things we're going to talk with, well, again, get you talking in a minute, is the narrative around this and words like reduction are really complex for a lot of people and challenging and confronting to some very core ideas about growth, economy, things like that. So uh, we started with the thing that is the most blindingly obvious, again, the thing that most newspaper headlines are about, the government policies of loaded in that direction, but you're right, of course, we could go to any other aspect of life and look at the carbon in a very similar way. And maybe just to add one thing, obviously when we put the numbers this way, it is very apparent that if you just want to adopt a technological solution, you cannot meet. So you need to start doing the deep retrofit and look at the broader picture and allocate emissions differently because if you just take what the government is saying, yeah, this is what we need to do, <laughs> it doesn't work. The budget is blown every year twice. Yeah, well, exactly. And so, again, the question we'd love to get you also discussing as well, maybe connecting both of your questions, is what's the right strategy here? So in Denmark, it was um, universities, well, actually companies, architecture mm -hmm. firms, and then property developers as well, uh, universities, others, construction companies coming together as an industry group and lobbying the government. Mm -hmm. And then the government took that into regulation and they took about 75% of the suggested target. To be clear, it's not exactly what everybody suggested, but it, now mm -hmm. that's in. And so, really interesting. Could we do something similar? Question. Could we not the same Yeah. Ten years, yeah. Yeah, we had a time frame. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Very good question. Yeah, well, again, I, I'm going to throw that back to you um, because in Denmark it was ten years essentially. They started at five to seven years, and then because we haven't got closer to planetary boundaries, we got further away. They said actually, okay, it's less than that. Which it is. This is, I mean, the, James pointed out, this is the reality. We're pumping that carbon into the air right now. So the clock is ticking. But you could take it at nine years, in which case it's 9.8% a year. Still a lot, but 9.8% a year is a lot more palatable as a message than 98%, isn't it? So, so that's why that's a stepped graph. We just, we just know that every single step there, we're making the climate worse <laughs> until we get to the last step. The trick on all the early, of all your early slides, you showed that there was a lot of vacant properties. Yeah. Uh, which exceeded the number of dwellings which were being proposed to be built. Yeah, more or less. Surely, you know, I know that's driven by what you hear in the investor market. Yep. Surely there's got to be some sort of attack of that sort of approach because otherwise we've got no way. If we're going to try to build our way out of things like that, what you're doing, unless you can go over and build a carbon negative building, Exactly. So, well, I did, I'll just say the, the Danish model, to be clear, which we haven't looked up properly yet in our numbers, is also reducing the amount of construction. So we didn't, we've done those numbers for Australia based on a consistent 200,000 homes, because that's the current strategy. The Danish model, to your, also to your point about how do we make the target a bit easier, says reduce the number of homes you're building in the first place. And if you pull the carbon down and reduce them, you can go more quickly. If you don't reduce the number, you have to go more aggressively on the carbon much more rapidly. So there's a bit of kind of push and pull between those numbers there. But if we use the existing stock more carefully, that would help us. 
But again, we've still got to do that in a way that's um, pulling the carbon down overall. And again, when we don't have any silver bullets here, I'm sorry, you know, we're interested in how you're responding to this with these kinds of questions. These are, these are the questions that are spinning around in our head. And I think right now, these are the right questions to be asking. There's not easy answers. One, one more, and then we'll, I want to try and get some, at least a little bit more of the group involved. Just a comment. Oh, okay. Just a comment. Uh, I'd say that every number in the equations and the calculations we presented is a potential lever uh, for change. So we started with 200,000 homes. Okay, if we build 100,000, that 0 0.2 becomes 0 0.4. Uh, we have an average size home of 186. Uh, if, we, if we go with uh, half of that, then, and also with uh, the halving the number of, of homes, that 0 0.4 goes to 0 0.8. So we're not presenting the roadmap as if you know, this is what should happen, but rather this is what we need to do under business as usual. And every single number there is a potential for, for change. Yeah, so we, we can do the models that can, you can see those numbers there. We're not really building for people's actual needs, we're building for investment. So um, we can slide those numbers around and we come up with a slightly easier curve or we, you know, we could go a bit slower or we could go less aggressively, but I got one last one. I really like what you said about there being multiple conveners to adjust these numbers. And I know we've mentioned that you don't really just have a silver bullet that technological advance that you fix this. How does renewable, that transition to renewable these numbers. Um, We've already. I know the, the transition to renewables, which is already embedded. Yeah, so this is included. Yeah. yeah. So we fully decarbonize electricity. So this is our operation is very small. The main culprit here is upfront embodied emissions. As soon as you build one square meter today, it's 650 kilograms of CO2 per square meter into the atmosphere. As soon as you put one square meter more on the market in the coming 10 years, even if you decarbonize, the decarbonization is not happening overnight, just set. So this is a, a linear regression, which means that until at least for the coming 20 to 30 years, every new square meter that you build here is throwing out hundreds of kilograms of CO2 into the atmosphere. Yeah. And there's no scale. So it's. Um... <laughs> so, so, so uh, this is the reality, and therefore we need to retrofit every square meter we have. We need to source our materials differently. We need to downsize and we start to pull these levers. Because as long as we deny this and keep going forward as it is, this is the result. We put one square meter in, we reduce hundreds of kilograms of certain So we build the work today. E yes. Now this report beyond the roadmap, which is the Danish one I referred to, has some very very good analysis of where we might need to get to. And just to be really super clear, you know, the really interesting thing they're now doing is not just as I said, the red bit here, pulling the carbon down, but just being aware of also the biodiversity loss whenever we make a building as well. So whenever we make steel or concrete, there's a ton of mining and extraction and that going on too. Not, not even thinking about the CO2, just that side as well. So we have every reason to do this. Um, and we can kind of see all these variables in front of us, but it's going to take hard questions or hard reimagination of amount of space per person, types of tenure, size of homes, number of homes we're building, how we live together, all of those things. They're all on the table, as well as the materials we use. Now, so uh, to Deb Chatra's point this morning, the physics actually help, helps us as long as we go with it. And then the minute we're going against the grain of physics on all of this stuff, and that's why it's so um, problematic. Now, I'm really aware of time because I know we could keep talking forever. But I just want to give you, let's at least take five minutes or so for you to, um, you can treat this as a kind of a counseling session <laughs> or as a strategy session or both. <laughs> And I su suggest what we do is just form some little clusters in the room and have a chat in your group for five minutes and then just give us a flavor at least towards the end of what you talked about. And it can just be like, we're in a mess or it can be, I have, I have a brilliant idea. <laughs> Either way, it's fine. 
But I'd really suggest it's very good for us to talk it through together because you can see we, we do not have answers. We have sets of possible answers, but they're all wrapped up, as Andre pointed out, in political and cultural questions as much as they are technical or physics based or they're economic questions. You know, they're really quite challenging. So we wanted to give you some time just to process a little bit in small groups, have a little conversation about very big things. Um, and I suggest that we just do it in like four, uh, maybe five clusters. So there's a group here, maybe, uh, yeah, up to you. you. <laughs> um, and then there's a group at the back, those three ro rows there. And there's a kind of a group down here, you three. Maybe a group in the corner and then one in the middle. 